Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Is this the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? Does Israel's massive attack near Damascus days ago widen Syria's raging civil war? What are the chances Iran and Hezbollah could be directly drawn into this conflict? Then there's the issue of chemical weapons. Should Western support of Assad's enemies be withdrawn if it is proven the rebels are using them against their own people? To Crosstalk Syria, I'm joined by Pepe Escobar in London. He is an investigative journalist and author. In Washington, we have Christopher Chivas. He is a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation and an adjunct professor at John Hopkins University. And in New York, we cross to Jeffrey Ingersoll. He is a defense reporter with Business Insider. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. Uh, Pepe, if I can go to you first, it looks like there's more and more effort to inflame the conflict in Syria than resolve it. Would you agree or disagree with that? <laughs> this is just the beginning, you know. I'm tempted to start, uh, you know, singing a little bit, Peter. What a wonderful world this would be, according, obviously, to NATO GCC. This is what they're trying, you know. Uh, it's the same old story. The U.S., the Brits, and the France inside NATO. The Brits and the France are trying to convince the other NATO members that little uh, weaponizing of the rebels is this way to go. Uh, the GCC, of course, those paragons of democracy, including the House of Saud, of course, which has been doing that for, in fact, over two years now, uh, in the black market, via Croatia, uh, you name it. And, of course, Israel. Israel just jumped in uh, because the plan A, which was uh, the lethal weaponizing of the rebels, was not working. There was this red line after red line. Everybody got lost in this Hollywood shuffle. Uh, at the same time, they noticed that the Syrian army was progressing instead of regressing in the Hama Homes Corridor in Syria. So the so-called rebels, the free Syrian army gangs and uh, Jabhat al nur style jihadis were losing ground. And at the same time, Sheikh Nasrallah went to Iran. Uh, he had a get-together with Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, they are very tight, so an attack on each one of them is an attack on all of them. Uh, so what to do? Plan B. Call Israel, uh, something that was already decided between Chuck Hagel, his tour of the Middle East recently, Israel and the Petromonarchies. Uh, Israel does it. Uh, if there are uh, Fateh 110 missiles, struck by Israel, good for Israel. If they are not, they still deplete the Syrian army arsenal, and we start all over again with plan B. So I expect more attacks sooner rather than later. Chris, what do you think about that, plan B? Well, I mean, I think that uh, the, the purposes for Israel's strike were the Fatah 110 missiles. I, I, I wouldn't read into it too much more than that. After all, Israel has conducted strikes against Syria even before this war started out. Their primary concern right now is, is Hezbollah. Were Hezbollah to get those kinds of missiles, it would pose a significant threat to Israel's air defense system, and that's obviously not something that they can allow to happen. Okay, Jeffrey, you want to weigh in? Plan B, as Pepe said. I, I think that Iran is, is basically trying to uh, to use the use Syria as a, as a smoke screen and all the chaos there as a smoke screen to smuggle weapons to Hezbollah. It's as simple as that. So Israel simply you know took those weapons out. Um, as far as Syria is uh, is concerned, you know that's a big messy sandwich and everyone's going to have to take a bite. Uh, it, it's not as simple as arming rebels. We don't really know who we're arming. It's a whole lot more fractious than we think. We're not even sure that what's going to replace Assad is going to be better. Uh, maybe a year ago, maybe. But, uh, but honestly, right now, I just think that, uh, that it's a mess and it's only going to get messier. Pepe, you want to jump in there? Talk Iran. <laughs> in fact, you know, all of U.S. think tank land left, right, middle, whatever, they know that Washington is selling itself the myth that the CIA is screening uh, which weapons go to which groups. This is completely absurd. Obviously, these people have never been to Syria. They have never been to the Turkish-Syrian border, and they don't know the players. You know, Saudi
Saudi Arabia and Qatar, their agenda is not Washington's agenda. It's completely different. Qatar, they want yeah. some kind of Muslim Brotherhood-led government in Syria. And uh, the House of Saud, they want a Wahhabi Emirate, which is going to breed lots of Al-Qaeda-style uh, types later on. Their agenda is completely different. And they are doing, they are arming themselves. Sometimes it goes through Turkey. Sometimes it's screened by the CIA in southern Turkey. But we don't know who gets these weapons, uh, you know, at the last resort. And most of these people are getting the weapons indirectly are Jabhat al-Nusra because they have very good connections, for instance, with the tribal sheikhs in Al-Anbar province in Iraq. A lot of commanders that, that affiliated with Jabhat al-Nusra, they're not Syrians. They're Iraqis. They were fighting the Americans in uh, Anbar province 2004, 2005, 2006. I met some of these people at the time over there, and now they're in Syria. They are doing the back and forth across the border. Okay, Jeffrey, you were agreeing. Go ahead. Well, you know, I think that, uh, I think that Iraq has a lot to do with it. Um, their civil war, and let's call it what it is, it's a civil war, is, is uh, spilling into Syria. Everyone's trying to, to get their piece of bread, get the big piece of bread here. And, uh, and Pepe's right. You know, the CIA, it's the same old song and dance. They've been doing it for 40 years. They did it with the Taliban. You saw what happened there. Um, and it's, you know, there's no excuse for it, really. And, and yeah, they, they are selling, there's, there's a couple things that they're selling. One thing that they're selling that they tried to sell late last year was that the FSA was this united, you yeah. know, Western-style yeah. military, and that's anything but the case. Yeah. Um, they're totally fractious, and, and they're fighting amongst each other. They're fighting Jabhat al-Nusra, and uh, everyone's vying for power right now. So, you know, there's, there's really only two good options here I see. One would be um, that we're able to, to keep Assad in power, and he's able to come to an agreement with the rebels in which they all get a piece of the pie, something kind of like how Lebanon, Lebanon's government is. And the other one is if the FSA can unite, and I just don't see that happening. And, and the, the, the more that we arm these guys, the worse off it's going to be. I mean, Libya is still a mess, and you, see, you saw that that spilled south into Africa. It's just... It's just a giant mess, and, uh, and giving them weapons isn't going to solve anything. So, I, I, honestly, I think that that's why Obama is sort of in a tough position here uh, politically. You know, he wanted to talk tough. Every American president what, uh, does. But um, really, what's he going to do? He, he's not even sure what, what he's going to do. And, they're, and now they're sort of backpedaling because they don't really have intel on these guys. They don't really know mm -hmm. who they are. And uh, you can't just go, you know, dropping weapons willy-nilly. So it's really a tough situation, and, uh, and Iraq is, is in the shadows. And, and I'll tell you what, if that erupts uh, right along with Syria, which I think it's going to, it's just going to be, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be horrific. And I, I don't think that there's anything that, that Obama, France, or, or Britain can really do about it other than to just let it play out. Okay, Chris, let it play out. If Interesting. I just, yeah, Go ahead, no, if jump I can in. just say, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know who Pepe's been talking to. I mean, he, he, he paints an interesting picture, but it's certainly not the same people in Washington think tank circles who I've been talking to, uh, many, many of whom are, have no illusions about the difficulties that are involved in trying to uh, arm the opposition. Uh, it's pretty widely known that there are a lot of risks. Uh, and as he noted, there's obviously risks that arms could get into the hands of nefarious groups like uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, nevertheless, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, and, and respectfully, I disagree that there's any solution in which uh, Assad is going to remain in power. That's simply not going to happen. We need to be thinking about a post-Assad Syria that protects all of the parties involved, and that includes the Alawites. And here's where I think, actually, Russia has an important role to, weigh, uh, to play. Uh, Russia can look beyond, uh, you know, the crisis today and think about, you know, what role it can play constructively in the future uh, in well, trying to well, I think guarantee it's been, the security it's been trying of the post-Assad It's been trying to do that for two uh, years. It's been trying to do that for two years. And no one wants to listen. Pepe, jump in. Absolutely. They've been, trying, they've been trying to do that, and the Americans have been saying no. Because Obama, you know, one, one, of, one of the first Obama lines is uh, Assad had to go. Yeah. And now the Obama administration is saying, look, <laughs> after two years, he's not going. He still has support in Damascus. The business classes in Damascus and Aleppo, there are no major defections in the Syrian army. I have to say that every day, because people in America, they are not listening. 
one or two generals that defect after a few months, these, these are not major defections. They still control the army. They are fully weaponized. So it's not going to happen. The only possible solution, I agree, from no, the beginning, that's, Russia no, was proposing that. Let's sit down there at the same no table, all, all the players, no you, including all the regional which, players, uh, and that includes Iran like as well at the table. To, and the Americans have been in saying a, no. In a situation like this, it's yeah, You can't just thinking. look all right, beyond right, don't Assad. Talk you to have to do something to get, get beyond Assad. Chris, jump in. Go ahead. What, what exactly are we going to do? I mean... I mean, we're talking about beyond Assad as I if it's already been written. Okay. How exactly do we do that? Because well, I'll tell you what, I mean, he's, he's said, shown recently are... that his military is quite capable of pushing the rebels back. Okay, Chris. So what do we do? Air yeah, strikes? Let's, let's, let's go to Chris first. Gentlemen, let's go to Chris. Insurgencies like this. Chris, go ahead. Insurgencies like this, uh, you know, last uh, for decades. There's no way that Assad, Assad could potentially hold on to power for, for a number of years, you know, if, if the international community continues not to take any kind of action. But in the end, he's going to go. And the question is, what's going to happen then? I agree with you about that. And the reality is, is that we need to do everything we can to protect all sides, including the Alawites uh, in Syria, from some kind of a major slaughter. And that's going to require a lot more international cooperation, including between Russia, the United States, and NATO, and our partners in the region than we're getting right now. Pepe, go ahead. Now, not only the other whites, Christians and Kurds as well. The Kurds, they are in northeast uh, Syria. They already have a measure of uh, independence. So practical, you know, in practical terms, it's autonomy. They would love that to continue, in fact. Uh, the Christians know that if there is a uh, Wahhabi-style Sunni hardcore uh, post-Assad government, they are doomed. And so are the Alawites as well. So if you have everybody at the same table, include, of course, with Russia, Iran, uh, and the Saudis, and all the GCC petromonarchies, plus uh, the Westerners, then at least some sort of adult conversation can ensue. <laughs> They're not even talking at the moment. All right, we gentlemen, have I, I have to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Syria. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the crisis in Syria. Okay, Chris and Washington, let's talk more about Hezbollah and Iran. Do you think it's possible they're going to be drawn into this conflict even more now after the Israeli strike? I think it certainly is possible. I mean, my view is people have been debating whether or not this is, a, you know, trending towards a broader regional conflict. I think it already is a regional conflict. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have reports of uh, direct exchanges of fire between Hezbollah and the opposition forces in Syria. Uh, we have reports of Iranian forces on the ground aiding the regime. Uh, we obviously now have this Israeli airstrike, even if it's carried out for another uh, for another purpose. Uh, the regime's response clearly uh, indicates that they view that uh, as a direct attack on them and part of the broader conflict. And then, obviously, we have the situation in Iraq, which is difficult not to link to the situation in Syria. So I think, you know, it really is already a, a regional uh, crisis. Uh, and the question is only uh, how much worse does it get? How much worse do we allow it to get? Jeff, how much worse can it get? Oh, it can get much worse. And, uh, and you know, like I said, I don't see any solution. I don't see any quick solution happening simply by arming um, the rebels. But in terms of... Hezbollah and, and Iran, I mean, they're already involved in the conflict. They've been involved in the conflict because Assad is their blue chip. How else is Hezbollah going to get armed? I mean, that's their main route, is right through Syria. So, you know, I, I just think that uh, the idea of looking at this in terms of borders is, uh, you know, it's naive. Not to say that anyone here is doing that, but they're already involved in fighting. They're, they already have boots on the ground, and they're already trying to shore up Assad as much as possible. Um, so they're, they're deeply invested, and they, they want to keep Assad in place. Otherwise, um, they, you know, Hezbollah is not going to be able to mount uh, uh, assaults on Israel as well as they, as they, uh, as they can with, with supplies from Iran. May I jump in? Go ahead, Pepe. Go ahead. Peter? Go ahead. 
Uh, to answer your question, uh, we have to wait a little bit. It, it depends on what's going to happen in the Iranian presidential elections mm. uh, next month. All the candidates so far, they are very, very close to Khamenei. So this is not going to change. This means they are very, very close uh, with the Revolutionary Guards as well. Uh, Syria is a red line for Tehran, and Hezbollah support is a red line for Tehran. How they are going to respond to what's going on at the moment, we're going to see maybe in two or three months after we have a new government in place where we'll have a president answering directly to Khamenei policy and not clashing with him like Ahmadinejad and his cabinet. But the thing is, uh, uh, in terms of uh, missiles, even if he, we don't know from any source whether Hezbollah bought right. uh, these Fateh 110s from Iran. Even if they didn't, they have a similar missile, the M600, Syrian technology. It's almost as good as the, the Fateh 110s. So the case of if they were attacking Israel by, in the near future, they would use the M600s. They don't need the Fateh 110s. Of course, everybody is on the ground. Uh, not only Iran uh, and Syria and Hezbollah, but the GCC petromonarchies, especially the Emirates, Qatar, and the House of Saud, not to mention the logistical support of Syria. And yes, I agree with our other guest. It is already, already a regional conflict. It's going to get much worse, especially because the, the West, via US, Britain, and France, they see they are totally impotent to conduct anything on the ground. And now we have jihadis let loose inside Syria. We're going to have Hezbollah playing against al-Qaeda, which is a neocon wet dream, of course. And we have the back and forth of jihadis between Iraq and Syria. Chris, you want to jump in there? Well, I just wanted to agree, I think, with, uh, um, I think it was Jeff who said that, you know, th that this is, there's no easy solution to this, that this is going to take time. I mean, I think that's a ra reality that everyone is confronting, and I think that's clearly one of the reasons why you see uh, the U.S. Uh, administration taking it slow. Um, it's obviously, uh, you know, a, a, a situation where people want to act with a certain degree of caution and an understanding that there is no perfect answer to this. Um, but again, I mean, I just, I, I don't foresee any world in which the uh, the fighting ends uh, and Assad is still in power. And I think that it's time that we all just accept that uh, and move on to try and find some equitable and just solution to the problem with the full involvement of all of the interested international parties. Okay. I mean, is that... Is Can that, I ask a question to our... Go, to go both ahead, our American I mean, guests? Is, is it the West's responsibility yes. to do this, all this, you know, to change regime in Syria? Peter, I'd like to ask our American guests a very important question. Bill Richardson, former governor of New Mexico, very close to the Clinton clan, he's been spinning since uh, last Sunday that the Obama administration is seriously considering aerial strikes against Syria. Is there any degree of truth about that, or this is just spin? Jeff, you want to answer that? Or Chris? Uh, I, I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon. I think that the Obama administration knows that they have to be patient. I think his red line talk was a little uh, <laughs> wobbly. You know, he, he, was, he jumped the gun a little <laughs> bit, although we don't want people to use chemical weapons. Uh, it, it, but no one's in a rush to go um, to go dropping bombs. Uh, it never looks good. It, it didn't look good even during Libya. And, uh, you know, of course, there's going to be American politicians. There's going to be hawks that are calling for it because it's, it will obviously remove Assad sooner. But they're still not sure. Here's the thing. They're still not sure what's going to replace him. And, and if whatever replaces him, it could be friendly to Hezbollah. Who knows? It could be friendly to, to the, you know, to anyone who's willing to fight, even though they're Shia and, and Sunni. They could be friendly to anyone who's willing to fight the, the great devil. Um, so I think that we want to sort of get a better bead for what's going on on the ground before we start making any decisions like that. And that, that's quite a hasty decision. And, and the other thing is that it's going to be difficult to get a bead uh, uh, in terms of what's going on on the ground. Uh, you know, there's fighting street to street. And, and uh, th these guys are very fractious. And, and these rebel groups are uh, they're, they're fighting for their lives. So, we, we, you know, it's hard to get good intel. I mean, as we saw with the, with the chemical weapons use, it's very hard to get good intel. Um, good, solid intel. So I just think that uh, I think that exactly. they're going to be patient, now and I think that, that they're the not going to be in a rush to say anything intel. that's going to get them in hot water. Pepe, jump in. Go ahead. 
Say again? No, just, I was just adding that to you when uh, Carla Del Ponte, she's very, very tough and extremely credible. She said two days ago that uh, recent gas was probably used by the rebels. Yeah, and now the UN is sort of dropped the gun and saying, oh, no, she did herself. not say that exactly. You know. Chris, what about the rebels using chemical uh, weapons? Just, no, let's go to Chris. Chemical weapons in the opposition, the rebels. Yeah, let me just, I mean, just briefly on the question of, you know, whether or not uh, the United States is uh, considering any kind of airstrikes against Syria. I mean, I have no special information, uh, but I would frankly be surprised if it's not being considered right now, given the statements that have been made by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, publicly, I think last week or the week before. Chris, would that be a good idea? What a Chris, would that be a good idea, be. in your opinion? Would that be a good idea? I think it's... Chris? I think it, uh, it's obviously something that needs to be considered as part of a broader effort. You know, Chris, uh, when does this ever work? When does this ever work? These interventions, when do they work? It worked extremely well in Libya uh, two oh, years really? ago. Oh, really? Today? Exactly what Martin Dempsey Libya is a mess today. Martin Dempsey Dempsey said the same it's a thing. mess. It's a mess today. Because there was a no fly zone. Your question was about they the, cannot the impose use of a no fly zone to take over out, Syria. Uh, Qaddafi's yeah. air force and uh, air defense systems What's that was done handily in 72 hours. I don't think that we could take out uh, of course, Assad's because air it's in the middle system, of the uh, desert. 72 hours. <laughs> not um, the case in Syria. But you know, for the United States military, especially working with and, NATO, and it's a little more iffy. That, that can be handled. Um, it would be very violent. There would be a lot of bombs. Well, of course, uh, bombs. that's what war is about. There would be risk of civilian casualties. Uh, but there's no question about whether or not it could be done. I mean, that's purely academic. I guess what it should be done. I guess, Jeff. Let's talk about the issues with the and chemical weapons. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I don't buy this whole UN report straight up. Uh, they're just not capable. They don't have the capabilities to deliver these, these weapon systems. Assad does. Um, so I would say, you know, it's likely that it was the, the regime and not the rebels who were using these weapons. She's gotten out ahead of herself quite a few times before. Um, in terms of making these wild claims. Um, I, I don't doubt the veracity of her research, but at the same time, she's thrown a couple red herrings in her career. So uh, I think we should, um, we should reserve judgment um, before we, uh, we all you know, pick up the football and start running with it here. I, I, think, uh, I, I just don't think the rebels are capable yet. And uh, th these are very complex weapon systems. It's not easy to put these things together. So. Um, so basically, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's probably the regime uh, using those weapons. It's not the rebels. Um, I don't know how she got mixed no, up, but I'd, I'd be willing to bet she Look, got mixed Ca up. Carla there. Del Ponte is not a suicidal operative. This is ridiculous. If she said that, it's because she has evidence. No wonder the UN start backtracking the day after. And no wonder the Americans were stalling this UN investigation from the beginning. Just talk to Sergei Lavrov. That's what I was going to tell you. Okay, gentlemen, what about the possibility it of... Seems pretty let me, clear let, let, let's change gears here, okay? Chris, what about partitioning the country? Right. Oh, I mean, yeah, I that's think the, that's, that's uh, you the know, original the planning multiple fact. options that we need... Go ahead, Chris. Uh, among the options that we need to, no one knows what's going to be the, the, the right solution for this right now. You simply can't predict this kind of thing uh, in advance. Um, but I think that partition is certainly one of the possible outcomes here. If, if it turns out that uh, an internationally supported uh, and UN-backed peace agreement that includes partition is possible, and that's going to stop the fighting, then absolutely, I think that should be on the table. Pepe, you got the last word, 20 seconds. And I'll add, let me, let me just no, add. No, Pepe, 20 point. seconds, go ahead, there jump are. in. Go ahead. This is, what, this is what Israel and the neocons have been dreaming for over 10 years. Just look at the Saban report about uh, regime change and, of course, later maybe partitioning of Syria. Look at what uh, uh, Sim Simur Hesh was saying already in 2007. Okay, divide and rule, a weak Syria divided into three warring foods, just like Iraq is already partitioning in three states. All right, as gentlemen, well. I have to jump in here. We've run out of time. Fascinating discussion. Many thanks to my guests today in London, New York, and Washington. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, crosstalk rules.